So we're thinking of starting a movie with something recent that will get us to think about who Vladimir Putin is. And it's a moment you mentioned as being like something out of the Kane mutiny, which is this national security meeting that he has with his advisors. Mm-hmm. Vladimir Putin, I don't know if you've seen the whole footage, but but it's mm-hmm. this ornate room, giant room. Exactly. Putin walks into the room by himself. His top national security advisors are sort of arrayed um, on the other side of the room. Um, if you could describe that moment and and what you see in just the theatrics of, of what's going on inside this moment where they're on the march to war. Well, it was a very, very strange moment because you had uh, Putin um, uh, at 20 feet away or more from uh, his entire national security team. They're sitting in, in an array like... Um, like school children, maybe, or um, supplicants of some kind, and he and he goes in a row, and they have to sort of get up and 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 pledge their their fealty to this idea of of recognizing these two breakaway Ukrainian uh, republics uh, in the east, um, and it's a, it's a very very strange moment. I mean, we, we see a lot of strange things in the age of COVID and people distanced in a way that they wouldn't have been before. But this, this looked like something different. Uh, this looked more like uh, something you would see in a royal court than, than you would see in a, in a modern government. And, and, um, and then the moment when the head of the Foreign Intelligence Service um, doesn't quite give the right answer <laughs> and doesn't quite um, say, absolutely, sir, we should recognize these republics. And, and um, uh, at one point, I believe Putin says, do you support this? And he says, uh, I will support it. And Putin pushes again because that's not quite the same thing. Um, he's saying, I will support it if, if you go ahead and do this thing uh, that I have some doubts about, uh, clearly have some doubts about. And Putin pushes him and pushes him and pushes him until finally uh, he, he asks for a yes or no. Will you will you support it? And then finally he says he says yes. Um, but to sort of dress down uh, the head of uh, the equivalent of the CIA in that manner um, is something I have never seen uh, before. Uh, and to have it staged for public consumption in that way uh, it was just very strange and very troubling. Very troubling that um, th- that a, a man with such power, such absolute power, is behaving in that way. What does it say about where power is in Russia, and what does it say about Putin himself, about how he sees himself, about what he sees as, as his role in that moment? It, it says that power in Russia is Vladimir Putin. Um, that power is centralized in Putin maybe in a way that it hasn't been centralized in any um, Russian or Soviet leader since Stalin. Um, uh, it be, to me, it, it seems that he has more power than Khrushchev had, more power than Brezhnev had, because it's all centralized in him. It, it, there's no suggestion that there, as there was in the Soviet days, that that there was a, a Politburo, a central committee, um, some some group of apparatchiks who, uh, if um, push really came to shove, uh, could could change the head of government. There's no committee governing the the, the actions of, of Vladimir Putin. Uh, it's Putin himself, uh, and everyone has to to pledge loyalty, fealty to, to Putin in order to, to maintain any position, any status in the government uh, in an almost groveling way. Uh, and, and again, we have not seen this uh, since uh, in Russia since the days of Stalin. I mean, it's an incredible amount of power you see in that moment. It, but there's also a question of how does he understand what is going on? These are also the people who are his advisors who are supposed to be telling him, you know, this is what the situation is on the ground. What does it what does it reveal about Putin's grasp of or or whether people are able to give him hard facts? It certainly suggests to me that Putin, who, who after all has has effectively been in office for two decades, uh, who's, who's, who's very experienced at this, who's had some success uh, as uh, as a as a leader, um, thinks 
he basically knows it all, um, and, and, and one does not get the impression that he's particularly interested in the counsel of his aides, and certainly not uh, in opinions that run counter to his own. Um, he, to me, seems, um, and, and I think his history bears this out, um, he has said that the dismemberment of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the century. Uh, I think he really believes that. And I think he, um, uh, if he could, would essentially reassemble the Soviet empire, the Russian empire. Um, and he's not, I don't think he's crazy. I don't think he's going to um, tomorrow invade uh, Latvia or um, Estonia, other NATO countries that used to be part of the Soviet Union. But I, but I believe he has a special thing about Ukraine. He seems to always have, have uh, uh, had this, um, uh, this almost mystical historical view of Ukraine's uh, importance to Russia, its relationship to Russia. Um, and I think he is determined uh, that Ukraine not be uh, an and independent Western-leaning nation. Uh, I think he believes Ukraine really is part of Russia, and he is determined, to the extent that he can, to reverse this geopolitical catastrophe that separated uh, Ukraine from Russia. Is this Putin's war? Is this Russia's war? You know, when we think of the Iraq war and the Bush administration certainly led us into that, but there was months-long campaign to bring Congress and others along and uh, intelligence, good or bad, that they were putting out there. In this war, does it feel to you like this is really about Vladimir Putin as much as it is about Russia as a country? Oh, this, this war, to me, feels very much uh, about Vladimir Putin and, and not really, certainly not about the Russian people. I don't think it's about uh, his, his aides. It's, uh, it's not about his government. It's not about resources or anything like that. It, it's, it's not as if uh, Ukraine is a great source of, of oil or something that Russia um, uh, could use in that way. I think it is Putin's war very much. Now, there was a buildup to it, uh, in, uh, it's certainly a buildup that Ukraine noticed, um, noticed the, the, the rhetoric coming out of the Kremlin, noticed um, uh, Putin's uh, threatening arms uh, build up on the borders, uh, you know, considerably before uh, it, it, it became an invasion force. Um, and, um, uh, you know, the world wasn't paying attention, arguably wasn't paying enough attention. Um, but, um, but, it, but this is inspired and, and carried out by, I think, Vladimir Putin and his own uh, sense of his place in, uh, in Russian history, his role in Russian history. Um, I think he wants to be a great historical figure. Uh, for Russia. I think he wants to be in the line of Ivan the Terrible, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, Lenin, and Stalin. I think it's Putin the Great is what he wants to be. Uh, and, and, and one of the deeds uh, that Putin the Great will have accomplished is reuniting Russia with Ukraine. Well, we're going to pick back up is in this 2015, 2016 time period as Putin, he's gone through 2014, he's seized Crimea, he's encouraged war in the east of Ukraine. And uh, the U.S. has had sanctions, but doesn't respond as strongly as some as some would want. And he's contemplating what he's going to do next. Um, he's about to uh, launch interference in the American election in 2016. Who do you think is Putin at that moment? You know, <laughs> If, if you think about it, um, the stakes were really raised for Putin um, uh, by what happened in Ukraine. You know, first, there was the, um, uh, the, the Orange uh, Revolution and then the Maidan Revolution. And um, uh, these examples of people 
uh, people power, of people rising up uh, to say no, uh, in the case of Ukraine, to a leader who's, um, who, whose agenda was this, this tight, close relationship with Ru Russia and Putin um, and, and obeisance to the Russian system and, and, and to Russia's desires. Um, uh, and the people rose up against um, that leader in Ukraine. And um, so, in, in a sense, um, Putin is he's certainly a man who, who thinks of his own self-interest. And, and there's a danger, obviously, with this close example in Ukraine, the brother country of Russia, uh, to have people rise up like that. Um, it could happen in Russia, and I think Putin is thinking defensively uh, in those years, and he's thinking, how do I make sure that never happens uh, in Moscow? How do I make sure uh, that what happened in uh, the main square of, of Kiev never happens in Red Square? Well, what do you think, looking back on him, would make him think, you know, I'm going to take the risk to, to launch an interference in an American election I'm going to be increasingly aggressive. Um, well, well uh, was, I, was, was that the turning point? Um, I, well, his interference in the American election certainly represented uh, a, a ratcheting up of, um, uh, of, of his risk tolerance, I guess. Um, on the other hand, um, number one, I think Putin believes the West is inherently weak and can be pushed uh, to a certain point, and he, and, and he pushes to that point, and if he doesn't get um, a reaction, uh, he pushes some more. And, and um, so he, he thought he could push that far. Uh, and he saw a clear potential benefit in a change of U.S. Uh, stance and policy toward Russia and, and attitudes, and, um, and, and saw potentially, um, first, it might have just been a, a chance to make mischief um, and, and, and create trouble for, um, uh, for, for the U.S. because if the U.S. is, is worried about its own um, uh, political um, uh, crisis, it doesn't really have time to worry about Russia and what Russia might be doing. Um, but uh, I think he came to see the genuine opportunity to, to change um, U.S. Policy, policy, to soften U.S. resistance uh, to his project of cementing uh, his, not just his own power, but Russia's power and Russia's dominance over uh, the former Soviet Union sphere. And what must he take at the end of that, where he's interfered in the election, he's been called on it, he watches, you know, whether it's the help of the Russians or not, he watches Trump be elected. Mm -hmm. and there's some sanctions and there's they kick out some diplomats. But but what lesson does he take at the end of the day uh, from he took this risk? And, and He took this risk and uh, and it paid off for him. And so he must take the lesson uh, that I can push further, that I can uh, I can do more. Uh, and I mean, look at the relationship he had with Donald Trump. Um, who stood next to him in uh, in Helsinki and and essentially said, uh, "I take Vladimir Putin's word over the word of the U.S. intelligence community." Uh, a, sh a shocking thing for a U.S. president to say and do. Um, so I think as long as Trump was president, I think Putin felt uh, he had a free hand essentially uh, to to pursue. Um, his own goals without much fear of U.S. Uh, uh, interference or pushback uh, in any way, not even rhetorical pushback, the kind of, of, of pushback that, that, that you would expect. And if the United States is um, it, it, it sort of backs off, um, that, I think, creates space for a similar um, um, uh, retreat, I think, is the word uh, in Europe. And the United States really uh, has to 
has to lead in this relationship and has historically. Um, uh, and without that sort of U.S. leadership, I think Putin felt unbound um, and, and unconstrained. And um, I think the result is what we're seeing now. Inside of Russia, there's increasing crackdowns on protesters. Mm -hmm. um, he's jailing Mulvaney. Mm -hmm. He's amending the Constitution to become president for life. Um, what, what, what's his approach inside Russia during those years um, leading up to now? And, and what changed for him? Well, you know, in, inside Russia, um, uh, I think the longer he was in power, um, and remember, he's been there for you know, 20 years. I think he was fairly systematic at, um, at making sure he had no rivals uh, in, in power. There's no figure uh, uh, around him who, who challenges him or who, who, is, who even looks like a successor to him. Um, uh, he, was, he was careful not to, not to allow that. I don't think he's particularly religious, but I think he, he came to, to see himself as almost ordained to lead Russia at this moment uh, and to lead Russia back to, to greatness. And if, if that is your ordained mission, uh, if that is what you are supposed to do, then um, there aren't a lot of limits on uh, the, the means you can use to, to achieve that goal, right? So jailing the opposition uh, becomes not just an, uh, an act of self-interest uh, in getting rid of a potential uh, opponent, but it becomes in the national interest because it is in the national interest for Putin to lead Russia back to greatness. Therefore, it is in the national interest interest to jail uh, Navalny. This is in the national interest to, um, to, to poison and, and, and kill opponents and, and, um, and drop them out of windows uh, and, and, and the sort of thing that we've seen uh, from Putin. It is in the national interest uh, not to have uh, the kind of uh, dissent and expression of, of public um, of, of public attitudes that we that we see in the other former Soviet republics that became independent and Western leaning nations. Um, that's not in Russia's best interest in in his mind. I think in, in, in Russia's best interest is to have him as its strong leader uh, indefinitely uh, because he is leading it back to greatness. You know, we often think about the Soviet era, but but it's almost more czarist. With exactly, he is, the, he is the state as you're describing it. Yeah, exactly. It is almost more more czarist. I mean, you could you know one one could argue that Stalin, you know, who concentrated so much power in himself, was somewhat czarist uh, as well. Um, but but not any of the other Soviet leaders with the you know, exception of Lenin, I guess, but um, but the subsequent Soviet leaders um, were were more um, like the head apparatchik whose turn it it came, and none threatened uh, to become czar of all the Russias, uh, and and um, and that very much seems to be the way Putin thinks of himself as more of a czar than uh, as a president. And in overseas during this period, he seems like he's emboldened. I mean, you mentioned the poisonings. They're happening in the United Kingdom. He's yes. uh, deploying troops into Syria and doesn't seem to mind the, you know, criticism, the accusations of, you know, war crimes that, mm -hmm. that, that Russia gets accused of. Um, what, what's his approach during that period leading up to now to, to foreign policy? I think he has, he has realized and understood um, that he does not have to stay within uh, what most of us would consider international norms. Because in the end, what is anybody going to do to him? Right? I mean, how, um, you know, um, rank has its privileges. Nuclear weapons, being a nuclear nation, um, a nuclear armed nation has its privileges. Uh, and uh, one of those privileges is, is that um, nations that, that may 
criticize you, that may disapprove of what you're doing, uh, that may be appalled and, and, um, and sickened and outraged by actions you're taking, have to stop there. They're, they can't go to war with Russia because it's suicidal to do so. Um, mutual assured destruction uh, is, uh, is still um, a, a doctrine that, that kind of works. And um, it, it's a fact of our lives. And so I think he learned that he can sort of push it to the limit and then beyond because in the end, um, the United States is not going to go to war against Russia. Um, uh, France and, and Great Britain are not going to go to war against Russia. Nobody's going to go to war against Russia because if you do that, you are signing your own death warrant and, and that of, of, of millions of, of innocent people. You're, you're killing your own country as well as, uh, as, well as his. And so um, since that can't happen, he can push as far as he wants. Trump loses the election, somebody who was sort of giving him in some ways a green light to do what he was doing. And and Biden comes in. But at the same time, Putin must be watching January 6th, the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Um, what do you think he's seeing in in Biden in the United States in this run up to the decision to, to go into Ukraine? I think he misperceived uh, President Biden. I think he underestimated him as a leader and underestimated uh, his position, uh, his strength as um, uh, as a leader. You, you see January 6th, you, you see an America that is divided, um, uh, that is uh, chaotic. And you can assume that it's it's uh, going to be less effective in opposition. You see uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan and, um, you know, Russia also withdrew from Afghanistan, or the Soviet Union did. I mean, it's not—so um, uh, so maybe, um, maybe you take a lesson from that, or maybe not. I think you look at Afghanistan, and you see a United States that may not have the stomach for confronting uh, Russia uh, if it does take action like he's taking in Ukraine. You, you look at a, a, a United States, not necessarily in, in retreat, but, uh, but a United States that is, is not advancing, advancing its interests and advancing its uh, power in the world. So I think, it, I think he's been surprised at the, at the strength and the unity of the reaction, both worldwide and within the United States. I think he anticipated more division uh, inside the United States about how to respond uh, if he took a step like, he, like the one he's taking now. Um, I think he expected uh, us to be slower uh, in reacting. Um, uh, I don't th think he expected the sanctions to be as tough as they are. Um, and I think he's probably concerned about further steps that could, could be taken to sanction the oil and gas industry, which would hurt even more. We started with talking about that national security meeting, but something that is really striking during the era of COVID, when you look at the pictures of Vladimir Putin, mm -hmm. that he's yeah. on video conference with people, that when he is in person, uh, he's at the end of the exactly. long table time yeah. and time again. Mm -hmm. what, what does it say about Putin to see these images of Putin apart, what, is it, what, what does it, it suggest is, anything about? Uh, it is very, very strange. I mean, again, even in the age of COVID, when we establish social distancing and we don't sit in, in, in tight clusters without masks the way we used to, um, uh, even, even then, the, the way he establishes uh, physical distance puts his aides or anyone who's talking to him really um, uh, almost on a lower plane, on a lower level. Um, it, it, it suggests that he sees himself as apart and above um, all of those he 
interacts with. Um, I, you noted that when President Macron of France, for example, came to, to visit, again, you had them sitting at opposite ends of this impossibly long table. I mean, there's, there's no sort of medical reason why, uh, even in the COVID times, why there had to be such great distance uh, between them. Uh, and so it has to be deliberate, and it has to be uh, a deliberate way of saying, uh, I'm apart from you, I'm above you, um, uh, uh, and um, you have come as a supplicant to um, ask something of me, and I will grant it or I will not. Um, but there's no sense of, of sort of uh, conversation as equals, uh, and and you can, by extension, wonder if he believes he has equals. So in the film, we've watched him. What he's watched the collapse of the Soviet Union. He's watched the U.S. You know, in his view, humiliate him and and try to undermine him. My question is: Is this the moment that, in his own mind, his life has been building up to the invasion of Ukraine? Does this? Does this feel like when you read his speeches and see what he's saying, uh, like the culmination of, of his life, the culmination of history leading to this moment for him? Um, you know, I do think uh, this is a culmination. I do think he sees his, his life as having led him to this point, to this momentous point. But I don't think he feels that he's finished yet. I don't think uh, uh, if, he, if he conquers Ukraine... Uh, and even if he reunites Ukraine with Russia, uh, I don't necessarily think he feels he's, he's finished uh, and he has written his legacy. I really think he sees himself as, um, as restoring Russia to absolute greatness in the world um, and uh, uh, reassembling Basically, the Russian Empire, you know, the, the Tsarist Empire, the Soviet Empire, whatever, whatever it was. Uh, that doesn't mean I think he's going to, uh, again, uh, start invading NATO countries. Uh, I don't think he's completely mad. Um, uh, but if he gets away with Ukraine, I do think he will um, continue to push. And I think he, what he will push for is a kind of... Um, at least effective neutrality uh, uh, from the countries on his borders. Um, uh, I think he is surprised probably now that he hasn't gotten that yet and that, um, that in fact, um, uh, those NATO countries and even countries that are not now part of uh, NATO, um, like like Finland, um, uh, and that Finland has been kind of neutral. But I think he's surprised that those countries are leaning forward and criticizing what he's doing uh, so harshly. Um, but I'm not sure he'll be entirely deterred. I think he sees first he has to deal with Ukraine. This is this is more difficult than he could have imagined, um, and uh, assuming he accomplishes eventually what he wants to accomplish in, in Ukraine, um, then I think he, you know, I think he wants more. I, I, I really do. Putin seems to be a very canny operator. He, minimal investment in the election and he gets great results. The mm -hmm. Crimea invasion is something, you know, they're able to mount without a military invasion or without military, without fighting. But in this case, it seems like he doesn't understand the capabilities of the Russian military. He doesn't understand the attitudes of the Ukrainian people. He doesn't understand what the response of the West will be. What ha what happened? Why does this seem so different in his understanding or how it seems like he understands what's going on? Well, we you know we talked about that distance that he establishes, that physical distance um, from his from his aides, from from outsiders. Um, you know, I think that that's a visualization of um, his, his distance from, um, uh, from realities that he really should have and could have been more in touch with. So um, he should have been more in touch with the capabilities of the Russian army and its lack of apparent readiness 
to, to really carry out an operation of this size. Uh, I think he was uh, certainly uh, not in touch with what people in, uh, uh, what the people of Ukraine were really feeling um, and um, how strongly they felt um, about their own independence and their, um, uh, their independence from Russia, from Moscow. Um, uh, he was out of touch with that. He was out of touch with how the world community would react. Uh, and again, I think he is, uh, he is a bit stunned by the, by the strength and unanimity of the reaction. And so if, if you isolate yourself, you put yourself above everybody else and, and, and you, you only listen to people who tell you yes and tell you what you want to hear, um, then you get, you get a lot of bad information and you miss a lot of relevant and good information and, um, and you end up making mistakes. And the way this invasion has gone so far, um, it, it's, it's been nothing like what he expected or, or what he wanted. And um, now he has the firepower uh, eventually to do to Kiev what he d did to Grozny in Chechnya. I mean, he can, he can just pummel it into, into, into rubble uh, and, uh, and win that way. Uh, and that may be what he intends to do, ultimately. That makes it a kind of Pyrrhic victory, but um, uh, he, does, he shows no sign of being willing to back down. You said that part of what this was about was, was Putin's fear of democracy, of uprising mm -hmm. in the streets, of, yeah. of what it was that Ukraine represents. And right now we have this mirror image between Zelensky and Putin. Yeah, right. what, how do you think he views uh, the Ukrainian president? I think he probably sees Zelensky as uh, a real threat to him, um, not just to his project uh, in Ukraine, to what he's trying to do in Ukraine, um, but uh, to, to him personally, um, here you have this man, um, uh, democratically elected former comedian, um, Putin might have dismissed him as, uh, as kind of a joke uh, initially. Um, I do believe that, you know, his, his idea of how to, how to get, how to carry out this invasion, um, you know, involves sort of sweeping in and, and getting Zelensky off the, off the scene. And I think he probably thought that Zelensky, um, once Russian forces started, uh, entering Ukraine, that Zelensky would immediately flee, uh, into exile and would set up a, uh, some sort of government in exile that would, uh, actually, to Putin's point of view, be irrelevant and, um, you know, let them have the little government in exile and I'll have my government in Kiev. Um, and um, the fact that, that Zelensky did not run away, and more than that, that he became um, this incredible leader, um, uh, became the, the face of resistance um, uh, and a symbol for the whole world in the way that he has, it has to be a real shock for Putin. And, um, and, he, and he must be wondering, you know, how can I, how can I rid myself of this troublesome uh, <laughs> Ukrainian president? You know, how can I get rid of this guy? Because, um, uh, I mean, look at the way he has rallied uh, the Ukrainian uh, forces, the Ukrainian people. Um, he's rallied the leaders of, of uh, and people of the world uh, in opposition uh, to this invasion. I don't think Putin anticipated there would be any such figure in Ukraine who could uh, who could accomplish what Zelensky is accomplishing. I mean, and it sort of raises the it changes the nature of the war, you know, between territorial dispute to one of, you know, an autocracy, mm -hmm. democracy yeah. sort of ideological conflict. What are the stakes for Putin at this moment? How much has he risked in this invasion? You know, because we're, we're looking at the arc of his life. How, how important is this moment and, and what's at stake for him? Well, this is a really important moment for him because, um, you know, he crossed the Rubicon, right? He, he, I mean, he went in. I think, um, I, I think it would be very, very difficult for him uh, to back down at this point, 
you know, he, he was offered various sort of uh, off ramps and he hasn't taken them to this point. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, does he really press on? And in, in part, I think it depends on the, on the performance of the Russian military uh, and whether they can um, show sort of more effectiveness than they have thus far at anything other than um, artillery and shelling cities, which they're very good at that, but in, but in terms of actually actual maneuver, in terms of, of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, resupplying forces at the front and whatever, they're, you know, they're, it's not working the way he, he wanted it to work. But I don't see how he backs down at this point. You know, I don't see, having gone this far, uh, and incurred the costs that he's incurring, uh, how does he then say, oh, okay, never mind? So what's the end game here? And, and I think he is certainly smart enough to see that um, uh, it is really an unattractive prospect to think of, of, of having to, to fight a long-running, uh, potentially really effective insurgency in Ukraine uh, that's being um, armed and um, fueled uh, by the West. Um, uh, but that may be, he may see no other option but to keep going and to then fight that insurgency indefinitely, knowing, you know, that it's a quagmire for him. Um, uh, but he stepped, stepped into the quagmire, and I don't see him at this point deciding to back out. I think he's just going to keep waiting forward. And for Putin, who thinks the U.S. has been trying to launch a coup against him, who watched Gaddafi being dragged in the streets and said, that could be me. I mean, the state, it must mm -hmm. be very personal stakes for him mm -hmm. at this moment, too. Well, I th I think it is it is very personal for him, and his main focus has to be on on Ukraine and what's happening there. But he has to be looking, you know, out the corner of his eye at um, uh, at his um, defense ministers, at at his um, you know the the uh, officials uh, around him, um, at the oligarchs who have so benefited. Um, uh, from his rule, but who who now um, are being punished in uh, in in material ways, and who are going to who are going to suffer, and he has to wonder um, uh, whether um, you know he he has made himself more vulnerable internally uh, the, by doing this uh, than uh, than he would like to be. The threat to him might not be um, you know being dragged out of the the Kremlin by a, a mob of, of citizens. Um, it, it might be being, um, uh, you know, deposed or assassinated or whatever um, by a, a, an effective cabal of, of oligarchs and, and, and maybe defense officials and others who get together and, and say, we have to stop this madness. We've been focused on Putin and on his motivation. It's a biography and where he came from. But one of the amazing things about it, and the reason the biography feels so important, is the consequences of this decision. You know, one man making a decision. Yeah. What What are the consequences for the world, for Ukraine, for Russia, of a decision that that Putin very much made on, on his own? Well, look at the. I mean, just look at what, what's happened. This is a world historical moment um, uh, that we will look back on uh, and say um, this is one of those moments when things, big things, changed. Look at Germany, uh, the um, uh, greatest economic power in Europe, um, uh, has always been, in, in, since World War II, has been incredibly skittish about uh, about arming even itself, much less arming, uh, arming others about um, uh, any sort of militarism because of its World War II 
uh, past, uh, and it's World War II crimes, and, uh, and now Germany um, you know, supplying lethal weapons to Ukraine, deciding to, to spend um, uh, more than uh, uh, 2% of its GDP on the military, um, deciding to sort of arm up in a way um, that it was unthinkable. I mean, it was unthinkable last year, not just not, not just not just ten years ago. Last year, it was unthinkable that 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 Germany would be be doing this. You look at um, uh, uh, the the forward movement of NATO arms uh, to the sort of eastern front uh, of of Poland and Ro- Romania, and and how um, the United States and uh, and the NATO allies are are literally moving forces um, forward to position in those countries in a way, again, that would not, could not have happened uh, a year ago and would have been seen as, as, uh, you know, provocative and unnecessary. And why would you, why would you do such a thing? Well, um, now it, it, it seems very necessary. Um, and you look at the kinds of decisions that, um, uh, that leaders elsewhere are are having to make. I mean, um, uh, you know, how long is President Xi of China uh, willing to tolerate uh, uh, this invasion? Um, uh, how long is he? You know, is he? Uh, um, there are benefits to him from this relationship with Russia. Um, China is playing an even longer game, and it, and it doesn't involve, I think, um, um, uh, uh, being seen in lockstep with Russia. Um, uh, so I wonder about that. I wonder about um, you know the other sort of rising Asia superpower, uh, India, another. Uh, nuclear armed state, uh, traditional relationship with Russia. That's where it gets India gets most of its advanced weapons. Uh, yet, uh, even under Narendra Modi, who, um, uh, who who doesn't mind being kind of an outlier among world leaders, um, there's going to be a lot of of of, uh, of pressure within uh, India um, uh, to to you know to, to really rethink that relationship with Russia, uh, given what's happening happening in Ukraine. I think he he has reshuffled the 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 decks of the of the international order in a um, you know one move, one man, one decision, one move, um, one other man. Um, President Zelensky, because after all, you know, it's interesting. History is not so um, deterministic, right? It, you know, one person can make a huge difference, and Vladimir Putin is making a huge difference. I would argue that Volodymyr Zelensky is also making a huge difference in the world by by his bravery uh, in confronting Putin. My last question is: How dangerous is is Putin at this moment? He's obviously there's this talk of you know World War Three and and nuclear threat. There's a threat to the international order and the laws of nations. Well, how dangerous is he? Uh, how dangerous should we think that he is at this moment? We should, we should think that Putin's really dangerous. I mean, it, you know, it just just because he has brought us to a point where miscalculations um, uh, become potentially um, catastrophic. I think most of the talk about you know nuclear war and and uh, the third world war will be nuclear and that sort of thing is uh, yes that's bluster and he's threatening and and, um, uh, and and you don't take him literally but by the same token by doing what he's 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 done, and by speaking the way he's speaking, um, blustering and threatening in this manner, uh, he, uh, you know, necessarily um, uh, other powerful countries um, have to sort of be more um, alert and um, and be more prepared and and uh, and and start thinking about. Contingencies, and uh, you know, the Biden administration has been very 
careful not to put U.S. forces on higher alert, not to um, not to sort of um, take the bait in that way. And I think that's because um, of the realization that you you don't want to um, uh, bluff by walking closer and closer to the cliff um, because you might slip, uh, and and uh, and a slip is. Um, unthinkable. It's uh, it's the end of civilization as we know it. Uh, it is fatal. Uh, so you can't slip. He's playing a very Putin is playing a very dangerous game with his his rhetoric, and so uh, he 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 really increases the possibility that we blunder uh, into some sort of catastrophic nuclear exchange. And um, you know, I don't think that will happen. Um, but I think there's a much greater risk of that happening today than there was a month or a year ago. Somebody we talked to once said that Putin's like a rat. And when he when you corner this rat, he can always eat his way out of it. That's when he's most dangerous. Uh, how close are we to uh, to watching Putin get in that corner? And how could he... Uh, fight his way out of this, do you think, if if that's a, a really true description? I think that may be true. I mean, I, I, because I don't see Putin, um, uh, you know, just sort of throwing up his hands and saying, okay, I give up, I, um, uh, you know, and, and, and withdrawing. I, I don't see that. Um, I do see the possibility uh, that at some point he would take a face-saving off-ramp uh, of, you know, declared um, Ukrainian neutrality or some something like that. I see that possibility, but um, but um, but not soon. I mean, I I, I, I and I, I I dearly hope that some of the irrationality we see now is an act. <laughs> I, I dearly hope that he's. Um, He's, he's sort of playing uh, a madman on television, and he's not actually a madman. Um, that he's, uh, I, I hope a lot of this is just a, is, is calculated to scare us, because, um, uh, because if, he's, if he's really serious, um, uh, then, you know, we're, we're really screwed. He's got his nukes on alert. And I, I just, I, you know, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about nuclear war usually. And, um, and I thought we had gotten to the point where the world had to think less about that. But, um, but we're not. We're not. That's a, that's a longer range issue for the world, I think. And it'll be interesting to see if, you know, assuming, and, and I, I do think this will and somehow, other than with the destruction of the world, um, it'll be interesting to see if this reignites any interest in um, any renewed interest in nuclear arms control and in in sort of lowering that temperature um, around around the world, or if it has the opposite effect and in fact ends up spurring uh, other uh, developed nations that could easily acquire. Um, their own nuclear weapons, like South Korea, um, Germany, um, you know, well, all the developed nations could could have crashed nuclear programs and have nuclear arms in, you know, in, in practically no time. Um, and so does this end up making more nations want to become nuclear armed? That would be a nightmare scenario. And again, in not thinkable a year ago, um, very plausible today. My question's about NATO. Uh, so Trump had been bashing NATO for years, and uh, he even talked about removing the United States from NATO. So I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that acrimony that Trump had towards NATO and how Putin would have perceived that. You know, what did, what did he see in Trump's treatment of NATO? Well, I, you know, I don't know if Putin sees NATO as an actual threat to Russia, an actual threat to him, or, um, or a humiliation. 
um, and but he does, I think, or did feel humiliated uh, when NATO sort of expanded um, right to the border of Russia. He sees NATO, I think, as fundamentally a, an anti-Russian alliance, um, not a not an alliance um, of sort of Western security, but an alliance against Russia. I think that's the way he sees it. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, he's, he's not the first Russian leader to have, um, uh, to have really valued the, the sort of territorial buffer zone um, between um, you know, Moscow and Western Europe. Um, uh, you know, it, it, um, uh, th- that seems to be almost a fetish of, of Russian leaders that, um, that, that expands coming through, you know, Belarus and, and, and Ukraine. That's, they're a big part of that buffer, um, zone that sort of protects Russia from, um, its potential enemies in the West. Uh, those potential enemies in the West are now embodied by NATO in his view, and, it seems to just make him very uncomfortable, uh, the idea of NATO being right at Russia's, Russia's border. Um, uh, and I think that seems to be genuine discomfort on his part, whether it's legitimate or not, it seems to be genuine discomfort.